It's time to talk Gonzaga basketball. Get ready. It's the Spoke Review Zags Insiders Podcast. Here we go. Here's Jim Meehan and Richard Fox. Good morning. Welcome back to the Zags Basketball Insiders Podcast. The last one of the season. Richard Fox, Jim Meehan with you. Another half hour of fun and analysis. And uh, we're going to go back through the last game of the year. The The road to the Final Four, uh, it ended a couple of exits early uh, for the Zags. They, they fall in the Sweet 16 to Purdue. Uh, 80-68 was the final from Detroit. So the Zags finished 27-8. and eight. They go to, uh, to their ninth straight Sweet 16. Nobody else in that picture. I think the next closest is five with Houston. 15th straight first round win. Kansas has 17, I believe. That leads the country in active streaks. 25th straight NCAA tournament. I believe that stands third. Uh, on the on the list of active of active streaks right now, so we got a lot to talk about. We got to go through the uh, the last game and look forward to next season. We're going to make our final four picks. Uh, I think the Zags were what 17th coming into that game. I'm pretty sure they'll rise a few spots in the final poll. AP is putting out a final poll this year uh, that will come out after Monday night's game. I think they'll be in that 15 range. So we got a final four with UConn versus Alabama. We've got North Carolina State versus Purdue. And Foxy, uh, I guess just maybe a thought overall on, on this season, the ups and downs and and uh, where they got to. Uh, what would you make of this five-month odyssey? You know, I think that this group maximized what they could be. And I think you had it right going into the week um, with respect to the Sweet 16, maybe being where the ride ended. But, <laughs> excuse me. Um, yeah, think about where they were after we got to the non-conference. Even as we got towards the end of January, there with the loss at Santa Clara, um, you know, obviously ended up losing at home to St. Mary's. It looked pretty bleak. I mean, it, it just it felt like... Uh, you know, quite frankly, I was having a lot of flashbacks to that group with Wiltshire and Sabonis who had to win the conference tournament and made that run to the Sweet 16 and were, and were just a couple of possessions away from being Syracuse to go to the Elite Eight. So um, I give them a lot of credit. You know, I, I certainly, I think for the most part, the staff hit the right buttons. Um, you know, the most notable one being putting Ben into the starting lineup. I think that changed their season. Um but if you if you think about where EK and them hard were to start the year and where they ended up, you know, those guys got better throughout the year, more comfortable. And Hickman certainly had a great season. When you compare to what he did last year and Anton, um, you know, I don't know if he could have asked for a better senior year. So I think on balance, I mean, I think this team did kind of extract it as much as they could from what they were and, and, and what their potential was. And I think at the end of, end of the day, that's, that's a sign of a successful season. Um, I don't think anybody really – thought this group was a legitimate national ch championship contender or even a final four caliber team. So to get to the sweet 16 and, and, and play with Purdue for a big part of that game, I think uh, all in all, it's a big, it's a great season for them. Yeah. I'm with you. I, I think they, uh, they didn't empty the gas tank, but they were pretty close. They were, the, the red light was on the dashboard when they <laughs> got to that second half against Purdue. So now let's talk about the Boilermakers. Great nickname. First of all, give them credit for that. <laughs> I thought they, uh, I thought we were in for a real classic. We talked about this last week. I thought this was going to be a last minute game, uh, crucial possessions. Uh, and after the first half, I was, I was very comfortable thinking that was going to be the case. That half reminded me of the Kansas and Gonzaga half the week before in the round of 32. It was very offensive minded, just outstanding execution. Uh, entertaining to watch and Purdue got uh, got a little momentum right there at the end of the half they got a three-point play from Edie uh, we'll talk a lot about Zach Edie here in a minute but uh, I think the biggest surprise to me uh, was uh, contrary to Kansas the Zags really kind of lost their way offensively and we haven't seen that in a while uh, maybe St. Mary's in the in the title game in Vegas uh, to some degree but they just did not have the same uh, pop in the second half, weren't getting the same looks, weren't finishing as well. 
Um, and that uh, Purdue did not slow down. They were the Zags <laughs> of, against Kansas. They just kept going the whole game and doing their thing, whereas uh, the Zags just couldn't maintain it offensively. I thought uh, Ryan Nemhard, outstanding first half. I think he had five assists right out of the gate. Uh, scored it pretty well as uh, it, it, to add to that. So second half, I thought Lance Jones got after him, dogged him pretty good, slowed down Gonzaga's offense a little bit. He missed a couple of shots he'd been making. So that that uh, played into it as well. But the rest of the Zags weren't weren't quite as effective either. And, and it kind of had a trickle-down effect. Um, we talked about putting Edie in the ball screens all the time and, and how that might work out. I'm not sure that they were able to to fully take advantage there. The kid just won't come out of the paint very much. He, he'll he get close, but uh, what do you think went wrong offensively for Gonzaga in those final 20 minutes? Well, you don't necessarily lose. It, it, the, 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 no, the run that's obvious is not necessarily the run that, that gets you. And I to me, I, I thought they were to a point exceptional in the first half offensively. They put Ed, you know, I, I had illusions of counting them, but I, you know, you know, when you're watching it with buddies, it's hard to do that. But I mean, 25, 25 ball screens in the first half. I mean, yeah, much just, more. It, it, so, yeah, yeah mo multiple ball screens in, in a possession. Um, and I thought that created problems because we always we talked about, you know, not to belabor the point from last week, it forces the others for, for Purdue to have to rotate some and you're moving the ball, you're moving him around, even if he's not coming out to the three-point line, hedging hard. You know, to me, Jim, where, where the game was lost was the way Gonzaga was playing offensively, I thought they'd be up 10 or 12. They were just humming along, but defensively it just was, it was, it wasn't there. Um, you know, it felt like the game plan was to let Edie kind of cook and try to, you know, take away the three-point shot. And they just could not do that. You know, in the first half, Pepperdine hits uh, Pepperdine. Purdue hits seven threes. Um, you know, Nemhard got lost in the wash two or three times. You know, Jones comes up for a three in the corner. Gillis, he was kind of watching Edie. You know, and lost track of who he was guarding several times. Uh, Nemhard and Hickman are on the weak side, and you know, there's a, the 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 ball screen action. Purdue had their, uh, in the first half, throughout the game, but really in the first half, really seemed to confuse Gonzaga. I don't know if they were ready for what Purdue was going to do with the two-man, Purdue and Gillis or whoever it might be, might be even lawyer. That ball screen action really gave Gonzaga problems, and so that allows Edie to kind of roll. And you'd see Nemhard and Hickman on the weak side diving in to try to slow down Edie. That, that's a waste of time. If they throw it into Edie, you're not going to stop him. But when they did that, they'd really come off shooters on the weak side, and Purdue just kept, you know, felt like they either with drill penetration or with the pass would skip it over the top. And Gonzaga gave up a lot of open threes. And to me, that that's where you, you were playing to a level offensively where had you been able to execute what you wanted to, to do defensively, I think you've got a lead going in a half. And that, that cushion, that momentum, I think would have bled over and really been helpful in the second half. But then you find yourself, in, you know, you're down one or whatever it might have been that half versus having a year down four versus having a, you know, a bit of a lead. So, you know, I watched it a second time and that was really what stood out to me. Jim was defensively. I thought Gonzaga was not good. It, it felt like they were no man's land a lot. There was one possession where Ben's on the, you know, Greg's on the left wing. He's going one-on-one -on -one with uh, EK. And for whatever reason, he dives down like, you know, as if he might be able to help. And Edie turns and kicks it out to a wide open shooter and he knocks it down. Those types of mistakes, so, you know, I thought offensively they were fine. Even in the second half, I think they had to take some shots they didn't want to. Uh, um, you know, certainly Nemhard kind of got cold, missed some shots to your point that he he, he could make. Um, and then I think the biggest difference is, I mean, I, I think it was a two point game when Anton got his foul, you know, started getting those foul trouble in, yeah. in foul trouble, mm -hmm. and that's when the game was over. You know, Anton's ability to. Um, you know, when you have him on the floor, you're way more effective with the three big lineup. When he's not out there, it's just not the same. You know, you're weaker both inside and on the perimeter. And I thought that I thought Purdue did a really good job of taking advantage of that. In the first, and we talked about this ad nauseum about the dilemma of of Purdue. The kid's seven four. He's three hundred pounds. He you can't move him. He can move you, uh, which we saw. 
Um, oh my gosh, yeah. He he is a man mountain in there, and and he is pretty darn skilled. He's a terrific player. We're going to get to the foul issues a little bit later, but you know they, he puts you into such an extreme. You you either let him go for forty like he did against Tennessee, uh, go one on one and 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 hope he's not quite on, or you have somebody who can stand up to him a little bit, or you you, you know devote a lot of attention to him in the lane and because he very rarely catches it outside 10 12 feet and a lot of times it's inside 10 feet and then it's it's katie by bar the door he is lethal from there but if you devote so much attention to him they at times and i thought what they were better when they had the uh kaufman ran on the bench their other big guy he's about six eight or nine um when they went with four guard wings and all Mm -hmm. of them you know deadly shooters it is and uh, well they, they all called it pick your poison and and so what i what i saw first half they did go one-on-one with him early um then they kind of switched it up and did some of the digging and the in the off i think a, out of his eyesight digging which was the yeah. way to do it stromer had a nice got, deal that way yeah and that's when they got like the three turnovers that the guy committed in that game uh second half it was well they've got seven threes let's try to cover up uh and Edie went to work I, I can't remember he must have had 16 of his 27 something like that in the second half that dilemma Tennessee faced it too although they got a break Purdue missed a lot of open threes mm-hmm. in that first half against Tennessee if they shot like that against Gonzaga the Zags would have been up six or eight ten at halftime the, the, I'm not sure I've seen a team that puts you into such a bind and and uh, I think you mentioned last week. Hey, if he gets thirty five, so be it. Shut the other guys down. Uh, they weren't a, they weren't able to make either either part of the scale work. They weren't able to take him away or the threes. And and, and I kind of tail it two halves. What first half all threes, second half all E. Yeah, it, but again, I I. I... I thought I think their idea going into the game was let's let him go to work, and I just think Gonzaga made mistakes on what they were doing defensively in the first half. Yeah. Um, and you know, credit to Purdue, I, you know, they they find a way to expose you, and it, those other guys get going from three. I mean, as, you know, we talked about it: Lawyer, Smith, Heedy, Gillis, and Colvin all shoot better than forty four percent from the from the three point line. They were seven of thirteen combined. Most of those are, you know, the bulk of those are naked three-point shots. No one's around them, or you're trailing off, you know, a staggered, or you're caught up in, you know, in the wash trying to rotate. Um, but you're right. I mean, it does put you in a, in a difficult position. I thought Tennessee's game plan was the, was the right one. You know, you, just because it's a, it might be a good game plan doesn't mean you're going to win. But Purdue's yeah. that good, right? You're trying to give yourself an opportunity to be in the game down the stretch and then maybe you know find a way to win the game. Um, and Tennessee certainly was in that position late in that ball game um, the other night. So, you know, it's, it, but it's tough too. Gonzaga's foul troubles that foul at the end of the half from Greg, you know, it's the first time I thought he looked really gassed, Jim. I mean, he just didn't have really much. I mean, the previous five games, you know, that's the, the WCC tournament, the first couple of games in the ancillary tournament, he's averaging, you know, in 30 minutes, 13.7 rebounds, shooting 10 of 17 from three, 67, 69 from the field. He looked yeah, exhausted. Wow. Two points in that game, uh, 27 minutes. And he, he just didn't seem to have any any legs under him. But you get that, you know, that's his third foul. You're now all of a sudden dealing with foul trouble inside with EK and Watson. Both of them, I believe, fouled out. Um, so that forces you to change up what you're doing. You know, if you can kind of weather it. And then Huff was just unplayable in that game. And I, I think the world of Braden, he's going to be a really good player. But, you know, nine, 10 minutes, he's minus 16 on the floor. You know, they just uh, took advantage of him inside and then put him in a ton of ball screen action. You know, and you know, he and Stromer in particular, they, they, uh, Purdue got a couple really good looks out of that ball screen action. And that's what you, that's what happens when you got two freshmen as your rotation. And I thought Purdue would, when both, both those guys were on the floor in particular, really look to try to take advantage of that. So, uh, I, I, you know, you didn't have to pitch a perfect game, but you had to get pretty close, you know, like a one hitter maybe, and they weren't anywhere, you know, anywhere near that. And, and you know, at the end of the day, though, that's you know, Purdue and Connecticut have been the two most consistent teams this year. 
Um, and I just don't think even on, you know, it might just be even on the best of nights for Gonzaga, they just don't have an answer for all of it. And uh, they certainly didn't have it the other night. Well, let's talk about the whistle. That seems to have generated a lot of attention, uh, especially after yesterday. I think they shot twice as many free throws Purdue did as Tennessee. Wasn't near as glaring against Gonzaga, although I think Edie shot every free throw. <laughs> seven of ten against Gonzaga. <laughs> yeah. Zags had seven free throws. Edie did not have a foul on the stats I'm looking at. Is that right? Or yeah, against Gonzaga? Two. He, had, he yeah. had two fouls against Gonzaga. Oh, yeah, two. I'm sorry. He did. Yeah. Well, I think his first foul might have been the second half. But mm -hmm. anyway, uh, I, and I've told you this. I rarely discuss the officiating, especially when I'm writing about a game. Uh, I just think most of the time it's, you know, it's a handy excuse. Everybody jumps to, to, to explain away a game. Uh, I don't think uh, how it was officiated. Uh, I, again, I don't think the Zags, it changes the outcome. I think Purdue was, was the better team that day. He drew nine fouls. I think he drew more against Tennessee. Uh, but there was clearly a lot of frustration from Gonzaga's staff on the bench, Mark Few very animated a couple of times when he ran over Nemhard on that offensive board. I'm like, could it look any worse when a seven, four guy runs over a six foot guard and lands on him uh, and no call. Uh, and I thought one or one on Anton and one on EK were also, uh, I mean, I thought EK just walled up. He might've scored. I can't yeah. remember if he did or not, but it was, I mean, what else? I think you have the right to stand up straight. I, I don't know. I think that's still legal uh, in the basketball world. But <laughs> I, I thought the Zags were frustrated with that. And I thought that bled over into, uh, you know, to how they played a little bit. Um, look, he's going to get a lot of calls. He's he, he, When people try to contest his shot, they're not hitting the ball nine times out of ten. They're hitting a wrist or an elbow or a shoulder uh, or something to that effect. Uh, but I, I did think uh, on balance, probably a little bit Purdue's way compared to Gonzaga's. This contributed to Gonzaga's spotty offense in the second half. Guys in and out. Anton's in and out uh, of the lineup. EK had foul trouble. Ben Gregg didn't even start the second half. I mean, those are, mm -hmm. uh, are guys that they've relied on so much. Uh, Zags were very complimentary of Edie. I am very complimentary of Edie. The kid's a terrific player. Um, you know, they pick their words very carefully, but sometimes I don't think they knew what to do, what they could, how they could play them. Uh, again, didn't change the outcome, but I, I'm curious what you thought as a big guy watching another big guy operate. What'd you think of the whistle? Well, you know, let me pull my soapbox out here real quick. Um, well, first off, it's not just the foul that they missed with Nemhard. There was a drive in the first half that Watson was coming down the lane and, you know, Edie's, you know, hits him with his shoulder. Edie's kind of out of position. Anton misses the, the shot. That's a foul. You know, Edie's not in legal guarding position and, you know, runs into him. You know, it, it, I, I just think, look, I have such low expectations for officiating at the college level, Jim, that I'm not, I'm really disappointed. And I think you need to, you, you need to meet me there. Um, it's just the quality of officiating is not good on balance. You know, the, and, we, and we know officials generally they're they're really good guys they do their best that's not their full-time profession um and i think it's just really highlighted when you've got a guy like zach Eady who is enormous he's, a, he's 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 enormous at the nba level and it's difficult enough at that level to to officiate these these larger bodies um and i it, i just think it's difficult for these officials to know how to call it um and it's just really it from a when you're playing against a guy like Zach Eady, you're, you're, you're oddly enough, you can't really attack him directly very often because he's so big and he's so effective that you it's it feels like a lost possession. I mean, you rarely, I, I think Eke had two direct post touches where he, he attacked Eady. Generally speaking, he's catching out on the roll or there's a switch. So when you see those obvious fouls not get called, it's infuriating for you as a staff and as a player because you know how hard it is to play against them and how much it would help you if you got him into foul trouble. Cause that's that Purdue team is, you know, they've got really good role players. Braden Smith's an excellent point guard, but he's not a star. You know, they don't have another guy. 
they've got the guy and then they've built that roster around him exceptionally and they're it's like perfectly made to have you know to to play with the guy like Zach with Zach Eby's profile so if you can pin a couple fouls on him in the first half and he's got to go sit down we talked about that last week that's a huge benefit because Gonzaga's going to win those minutes on balance if Gonzaga's playing Purdue without Zach Eby they're a better team but they never they, they didn't get those calls and so but I think you just have to lower your expectations. I'm not surprised. I mean, there's been a ton of blown calls in the tournament, obvious ones. Um, we see that every year during, throughout the course of the year, and, and we see it at the tournament. And, you know, once you get to that Elite Eight level, I think you start really getting down to those officials that really are good. Um, and maybe you have a different take than I do on, on the quality of officiating at the college level, but that's been my experience being around the game for as long as I've been around the game. Yeah. Uh, I'd say one more thing about Purdue that, gets a little overshadowed is they are very I mean they got down 11 or something to Tennessee and they're so flatline expression most of their guys you know including Edie though he kind of let it loose in the post game from what I gather <laughs> uh, <laughs> but they can deal with you know the ups and downs that you're gonna face you know everybody but UConn faces uh, they they just handle it and they move on they came right back scored like eight in a row they don't make a lot of mistakes at both ends. They don't foul very much. They, you know, they, they don't leave. Get, there's not a lot of wide open shots they give up. They might give up points, and I don't think they're locked down by any means, but they're, they're not a lot of errors. There's not a lot of turnovers. You're not, you're not getting runouts on them very much. They just do everything uh, by the book, well drilled, and it, and it really – to play a team like that, it's it's a little bit in that St. Mary's mold where you just – you don't feel like you can make a mistake because you're going to lose ground uh, in that case. And and so I give them credit for how they built it, how they play, how they get through things, good or bad. You wouldn't know if they're well, up 10 or down 10. And, and uh, yeah, yeah. that just applies infinite amount of pressure on you. You just feel like well, they got to be clean both ends. Yeah, they're not going to beat themselves. That starts with Painter, their coach. It always starts with the coach. You know, Mark's, you know, every once in a while you'll see him kind of lose it. But generally speaking, Mark is just even keeled the whole way through. Um, Matt Painter's the same way. Randy Bennett's the same way. Um, I mean, you look at the, you know, the coaches in the Final Four. I mean, even Hurley, as, as demonstrative as he can be, if you watch him during the course of a game, he's – pretty pretty calm you know i mean he's fiery for sure and he's got that hurly face where they have it's impossible for them to, to hide their disdain for the officiating and, and mistakes but generally speaking these top level coaches are calm even keeled and they're and they don't panic and their their teams don't panic and that's the thing about purdue and good teams across the board you have to beat them they're not you know they're not going to have that game where they cough it up 18 times yeah. you know that you know Teams that lose those types of games are the teams that, you know, throughout the course of a year have that kind of inconsistency. Inconsistency, but Purdue hasn't had that. So, look, they're a really good team. I, I'm, I'm hoping, uh, you know, that, you know, we'll, I guess we'll talk about it, but Purdue and UConn would be a tremendous final uh, oh. final matchup. So, but yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. Well, we talked about kind of the Zags maybe going about as far as they could. I think the flip side of that is what I saw in the locker room with guys that, uh, when when you get going the way they did and get on a roll and whatever it was, 17 out of 19, playing offensively at a very high level, uh, got better and better. I thought got better and better defensively, too, as it went along. Yes, they, they were running on empty, but I still think they were they were quite disappointed just because, hey, if we play like we're playing, you know, this game might have been different. And, uh, again, Purdue – all the credit they they don't give you much margin of error and and, the, and they took care of business in the second half so uh, kind of balanced with uh, yeah we're very proud of what we did but man i wish we'd have given them our best shot they weren't quite able to do well, it yeah I, I, yeah I think the way they lost is is, is you know that that yeah. the taste in your mouth afterwards you know it's yeah. it's funny sometimes losing you know a buzzer beater as devastating as that is you know yeah. it doesn't take long for you to to realize we, we were in a spot where we could have won that game. But when it gets away from you and you've got those however many minutes, you know, left in the game or on the bench knowing that it's over, 
That's really, that's, that's a bitter pill. You know, you just want, hoping that you would have had a better, better effort, better performance. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's look at uh, what the Zags might be next year. Uh, no Anton Watson. Uh, one of the, one of the great players that they've had come through for five years, uh, just as dependable as, as you could ask for and, and uh, beyond the basketball court, what he did uh, in the community. Uh, he, he is a revered, <laughs> revered Zag, mm-hmm. a legend is what several of the players called him, but no Anton next year. He's a big hole in, in their uh, starting lineup. Everybody else is eligible to come back. Uh, this is 2024. There is that NIL thing. There is the <laughs> transfer portal deal, the comings and goings of the transfer portal. We all know well, the Zags lose three last year and brought in a couple. So, uh, you know, they've already signed uh, Pepperdine forward, Michael Ajayi, um, kid six, seven, scored it well, 17 ish, nine rebounds right up there with the league leaders. I don't think he's penciled into Anton's spot. He's a different player a little bit. Uh, but you've already got, if you've got all these kids coming back, if you've got EK, Huff, and Greg at uh, the Pepperdine transfer, that's the four-man big rotation again. And it's a rotation where each guy is different. They're not cookie-cutter guys. They're not two seven-footers that have to play five you know you got ben Gregg who can shoot it ajayi shot it very well uh, obviously ben huff can shoot it uh Braden huff can shoot it from from beyond the arc and graham ek hit two threes against purdue there's only two games of the year the two threes were against purdue uh we might see a little more of that but anyway i think the front court is almost uh uh well stocked unless something happens I, i'm not so sure graham ek doesn't test the waters just to see where he stands with NBA folks, uh, Ryan Nemhard, same deal. You know, he's played three years of college ball. This would be the time if you want to get that evaluation. Even Benny Gray. I mean, he's had a, he had a great year, and I guess there's no harm in dipping your toe in uh, and coming back. That's happened a lot as well with the Zags. Um, so that's the starting point with the front court. You've got Nolan and, and Ryan, if they both come back, um, you know, obviously played a ton of minutes, uh, seemed to grow more comfortable playing with each other, you know, Nolan more in an off guard role. Uh, to me, it looks like the one spot they would love to try to add is maybe a, a transfer guard, something in that six, three to six, six range athletic, uh, maybe chart change how they could guard another team's perimeter, uh, give them a bigger, uh, 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 option offensively. Uh, we'll see. Those they don't grow on trees, but the Zags have, have found guys that way. Uh, what do you think? Do you expect anybody to leave? Um, I, there's almost always, it, I'd be shocked if it didn't happen in this day and age, but it does seem like the core rotation is going to be back. What do you see that way? And what do you see as their biggest need right now after adding the Pepperdine transfer? Well, I mean, generally speaking, the guys are leaving the guys who maybe didn't think they got the an opp- the opportunity the opportunity opportunity that they thought they should. You know, English is hard. Um, and so, if you look deeper on the bench, June, Luca, Stoyak- you know, uh, Stoyakovich, or uh, Stovich, um, you know, and you you want to make sure you, you put a you know give Stromer and Huff a big embrace and let them know they're a big part of the future. I mean they should know that. I mean both those kids have a lot of talent and uh certainly grew up a lot you know, throughout the course of the year. I thought Dusty was great down the stretch this this season. Didn't score against Purdue, but you know he kind of got back to guarding. You know, he 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 looked like he belonged. And then Huff's going to, you know, he'll get better, stronger. I think start figuring it out a little bit defensively, but obviously everyone knows what he can do on the offensive side of the ball. Um, you know, Ventress didn't play this year, but you, you could argue that's their wing. I mean, oh, effectively, sure. yeah. just yeah. kick it, you know, picking the transfer down the road. I mean, you've got six that you know that played for you um, with the three bigs, EK, Greg, and Huff, and then uh, Nemhard, Stromer, and Hickman. And you've you effectively got Venters and Ajayi coming in. Uh, you know, Venters obviously, you know, had a great year at at, uh, at Eastern last season. Big Sky Player of the Year. He's an exceptional shooter, forty percent on his career. La- you know, the last year he played thirty-seven from three, but took over six a game. 
He's not a playmaker, you know, 135 assists, 132 turnovers, but they're not going to need him to do that. I agree with you. I think maybe having a more dynamic combo guard, you know, this is like fantasy basketball. All of a sudden it's like, just go get that guy. Um, but I, I do, they're small at times on the perimeter uh, with Nemhard and Hickman. And I think that you can sometimes see the lack of size show up in turnovers and the inability to make some plays, get their shot off late in the clock in a clean way. Um, although I think Hickman was tremendous this year and so was Ryan. So can they go get a guy like that? Uh, you know, more, more importantly, I think defensively, to your point, just be able to put a little bit more size on lead guards for other teams. And then up front, you know, I, I, I like the idea of getting, you know, the kid out of McNeese, I loved his game, Schumat, Schumat, yeah, you know, six, yeah. six, six, seven, you know, enough skill, but just, you know, a pogo stick. Can they get a guy like that, you know, kind of a combo forward or even a small ball five that just going to make plays everywhere on the floor? Um, you know, that's the one thing. This team didn't have any, any real protection at the rim. But Zaga's best teams, quite frankly, the best teams in college basketball have at least one dominant, you know, shot blocking type player. Um, I'd love for them to try to find that piece if they can. You know, I, I'm a fan of uh, Ajayi. I had both his games, but I, I would temper – people's expectations a little bit with them. Um, you know, you know, Pepperdine's 0 and 8 against quad one, 0 and 3 against quad two. You know, in quad one games, he played 35 minutes a game that you know averaged 13 points, but took 14 shots a game, really inefficient with the shooting. Um, and then in, in WCC quad one game, so that would be St. Mary's in San Francisco. Uh, in Gonzaga, he's you know 35 minutes a game averages 10. And shoots under 28% from the field. Yeah. And he's got a negative assist to turnover ratio. So I think tempering a little bit now that on the flip side, he's going to get, you know, I, you and I both really like Romar, but I don't think he's retiring and going to start putting together coaching videos. You know, I think it's going to be more structured here. Um, he's going to get coached up. He's going to yeah. be in a, put in a position where there's real expectations on defensively. You don't play if you don't guard. You know, I think he's probably closer to 6'5 than he is 6'7, but he does offer some versatility, I think, on both ends. Can he guard at, you know, I, I, to me, the, like the exercise is can he, could he have, could the player you're bringing in have played in your last game of the season? So in yeah. this case, it's Purdue. Could Ajayi play, have played on Friday? I don't know that. Yeah. I just, I just don't. And so you just want to see, can they grow into that? And there's something about I'm going to get a guy at a high major that maybe didn't have the year he wanted to, or a guy who really produced at a lower level, but played well against, you know, quad one teams. And you kind of know coming in and what you have. I think most years they brought in these transfers. They, they've got a feel for this is a plug and play guy. There's no question, Ryan, you know, Nemhard comes in. He's playing the Big East. So, the, you know, I think there's just questions. Is Ventures going to be healthy enough? You know, the ACL is not the same injury it was 20 years ago, but that's not an insignificant injury. And then uh, for, for Ajayi, I just, I kind of need to see it. Um, I understand why you take that, that make that decision to bring him in. Um, but that's a big jump. I mean, what was he playing junior college, Pepperdine, and now he's going to Gonzaga. I mean, that's a huge, um, that's a pretty steep curve. You're, you're kind of hitting all these marks. So his numbers are good, Jim, but... I kind of want to see what he looks like in Gonzaga's uh, system. Yeah, and I, I I don't think there's any way he averages what he averaged at Pepperdine. And almost all the transfers that come in, their numbers drop because when they're surrounded with what Gonzaga has, their role is not the same. And and so I would I would think he becomes just another important piece to that front court rotation. Um, I do think they need one more combo, you know, small wing. Shame on me for spacing out steel vendors out of sight, out of mind. You know, I forget. Yeah, but, uh, it's all right. It's he could right. be, I mean, remember Dalton connect was the, not the player of the year in that league. Uh, he's an all American. He's going to be a first round pick. It was steel vendors. And he is a knockdown shooter that at times we all saw, especially early uh, that could have changed the arc of the season. So I think steel is going to have a huge role. Well, he's not a, he's not a guy that relies on, you know, jumping over the rim and, and athleticism either. So I think the the ACL, uh, obviously a concern, but uh, it's not like it's going to uh, greatly impact his game if he's, if he's healthy. 
I, I think it's yeah, yeah. I, I think coming back from the ACL is, is significantly more manageable than it used to be. And often guys come back stronger than they were before just with the rehab. And he seems like a serious kid. Yeah. But look, I mean, he, six threes taken a game shooting that percent. Gonzaga needs that guy. And you can't just rely on Greg and Huff the whole time. No, they've had Stromer. They've had Kispert. They've had through the years, you know, Matthews, you want to go way back, whatever. They, they've had that spot pretty dialed here for a while. And, and I think it will be again between him and, and Dusty should be a, a strength next year. Uh, well, let's get to the final four. Uh, they've got UConn, who is just mowing people over. Uh, they beat. It's crazy. They had like a 30 to nothing run. I didn't see it against Illinois. Yeah. And Illinois is it's crazy. good. Um, you know, they're winning just like they did a year ago, tr- you know, just trampling everybody. They play Bama. Bama can really score it a little spotty defensively, uh, but they are very much that NATO to either score at the rim or shoot threes. Uh, and they're doing it well. They're playing well. Uh, Purdue versus North Carolina State. That's Zach Eady against the big kid Burns from North Carolina State. If it's Eady and Klingon in the final, my goodness, if, if Edie can take them through those two games and, and win it all, man, that's one of the great seasons they ever put together if he can pull that off. I've got UConn over Bama. I think Klingon is, you know, so impactful behind beyond the numbers. He's the kind of guy who can score nine points and still turn a game, a little bit like Anthony Davis did way back. Yeah. Um, he doesn't have, and on that team, he doesn't have to score. They're, they're, they're so well coached. Their offense is so cool to watch how they score, how they run their, I don't know how long their playbook is, but man, it is something to watch those guys operate. I've got them over Bama. I am hesitating picking uh, Edie and Purdue over North Carolina state. I really (laughs) believe North Carolina state is just on the magic carpet ride. I'm going to give a smallest of nods to the Boilers, and then I've got uh, I've got UConn repeating as the final uh, in the final. Uh, not all that comfortable with those picks, but uh, UConn has just been too dominant. They, they'd have to really come meet somebody halfway to lose a game. Uh, what do you got, Foxy? Yeah, I'm with you. I think UConn beats Alabama. You know, the one thing Alabama's got going for it is they do have some size to 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 go up against Klingon, and they've got depth and they shoot the ball well. Um, if they get hot from three, you know that's the ultimate equalizer. But I just I'm with you. The the way UConn plays uh, um, offensively, it's I, I just don't know how you scout against it. It just feels like they have so many options in their action, and they give those guys so much freedom to make decisions. And then defensively, if Klingon stays out of foul trouble, I mean, he's as, as dominant as Edie is. I think he's a, a much better defensive player. He's more mobile. Um, you know, he, he will come out in a way Edie won't. So I expect UConn to win. I'm with you. It's hard to you – know, I love DJ Burns and kind of everything that NC State's got going. But, you know, at some point, you know, I, I do think you maybe come back to earth a little bit um and and kind of play the way you were playing before you got hot in ACC tournament but that's going to be a really fun matchup with Edie and Burns because Burns is just unique left-handed he's he got he's gonna he's gonna outweigh Edie uh he's not afraid you know um but I just think you know I'm gonna I'm gonna go with the consistency that Purdue showed all year and I I think they're gonna find a way to win that game and that's gonna be a really interesting matchup in the in the final UConn and Purdue Look, UConn's a better team. They've got actual pros. I mean, Edie's certainly going to get drafted, but I, I think uh, his prospects at the uh, NBA level are probably somewhat limited, in my in my opinion. Huh? But UConn's got several pros. Um, but that's going to be really interesting because that you know maybe for the first time in two years, UConn's going to have to think about what to do with another player on another team in a, in a real way. Uh, Edie can make you change the way you defend. Um, so yeah, it's you know I'll, I'll be watching all three of those games. It's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, should be a good one. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of buzzer beaters. Maybe we'll we'll get one here in the final four. It hasn't quite had that drama that we've seen in no. past tournaments. Either that or I was working and missed them. But I haven't seen that buzzer boom game over. Dimitri Goodson, you know. 
Jalen Suggs. Uh, Jalen yeah, yeah, yeah. Suggs, that, that deal. But we'll see. Hey, uh, that's going to do it for the season. Great year. Foxy, could not have had more fun with you. Um, just uh, just an enjoyable uh, every Monday morning getting together with you and talking about the Zags. Uh, our thanks to Christy Burns. Heartfelt thanks for, to Christy for running the show. And, and most of all, everybody who tuned in. Uh, I think we 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 had, we did well on on uh, viewership and listenership. I think it grew all through the year. I think we got better. We did a little bit like the Zags. We got better as the year went on. Uh, so we we appreciate everybody that tunes in every Monday. I'll post this in about an hour or two. And uh, barring an a, an emergency podcast, maybe we'll get together in the off season. But uh, until uh, November, thanks for joining the Zags Basketball Insiders Podcast.